Pranam, and a very warm welcome to all of you. It's a joy to welcome you to this year's World Convocation, when we can drink deeply of the eternal truths that our beloved Guru has brought to us. My name is Sister Draupadi, and the subject of our talk today is being a spiritual seeker in today's complex world. And to start with, I thought we could provide a bit of context concerning this complex world that we live in, and especially our role in it. As we all know, throughout human history, the human race has undergone many crises. And in our lifetime, we've experienced one of them, a pandemic that has impacted the entire globe and just about every aspect of our lives. So it's natural for us to have deep concerns and to ask, what will happen next? Will we be safe? Will we have a livelihood? And so forth. And all of these questions are very valid. At the same time, as devotees on the path, it's also good for us to reflect and ask ourselves these questions. What should my philosophy of life be? What should my spiritual attitude and approach be to this world situation that I live in? The answers to these questions are key for us because if we get them right, they will anchor us on every level. And to find those answers, we need only look at the message that every savior of mankind came to deliver. And that is that this world is not our home. And we are not mere mortals. Rather, we are the immortal children of God. And if it can be said that God has a desire, it would be for us to walk this earth as heirs to his kingdom of divine consciousness, of ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss. In Sanskrit, the name for that supreme state of consciousness is Satchitananda. And where does this kingdom exist? The core message that Jesus delivered was, the kingdom of heaven is within you. So this kingdom of Satchitananda is right here, right now. It's our real home. It's right within us, and it is our true nature as the soul. And perhaps this is why, from our own personal experience, we find that whenever we look outside of ourselves for any sense of security or safety or fulfillment or a love and happiness that lasts, we don't find it anywhere in anything or anyone. And yet the Divine Ones tell us that there is a wealth of divine security, of soul fulfillment, and of a love and a happiness that outlasts right within us. So we the soul have to look in the right place and we will discover it when we unite our consciousness with God. So we the soul also play a human role Life after life, age after age, each one of us puts on a new garment after we've discarded the old one. And we're given countless opportunities for soul development. And I remember on one occasion, our beloved Mrinalini Mata was reading from Guruji's writings, wherein he was describing the soul's journey through the various world cycles. And Swami Sri Yukteswarji describes these yugas in his book, The Holy Science. And Guruji was describing life in those higher ages, especially Satya Yuga. And he said that it's a golden age of perfection, of truth, of enlightenment. And the people of that society are so highly developed that they all understand that the purpose of life is ultimate freedom in God. And in that society, virtue reigns supreme and is so developed 
that people can comprehend everything, including the mysteries of spirit. And as I listened to Guruji's description, the thought came to me, hmm, this sounds familiar to me. So the next day I asked Merlini Ma, do you suppose that some of us may have lived in those higher ages? And she looked at me with this expression of disbelief on her face and she said, my dear, we have been round and round and round many times. And I said, oh no, and we're stuck here in this low age once more. And she said, no, no, because in this lifetime, we've been given a golden opportunity. We've been drawn again to Master's feet and to his Kriya Yoga teachings that come from those higher ages. We've received so much in this lifetime let us make the most of what we have received. And then she added, besides, we don't know how far we've already traveled on the spiritual path. Those are beautiful words. They give us a lot of hope. And when she said we've been given so much, how true, because God has given to us the greatest gift imaginable a true guru, a sat guru, who's always with us, watching over our soul path and helping us to awaken that beautiful soul divinity that's hidden within our heart and consciousness. And about knowing or not knowing how far we've already traveled on the spiritual path, I want to share with you the words of Swami Anandamoyji. He said, the mere fact that you were drawn to Master's Kriya Yoga path is evidence that you've been on your spiritual journey for more than just this one lifetime. Master said, you do not begin your search for God with Kriya Yoga. You end with Kriya Yoga. And our Guru also said that we can rise above the age in which we were born. Think about that for a moment, because here we are in Dwapara Yuga, and yet we're striving to live and apply the teachings of Satya Yuga, the Kriya Yoga teachings. And Guruji said, you also find those in this age who are living ahead of their times. Well, we're here today and in this moment, Guruji is also saying to us, it is time you remember who you are, the blessed soul, a reflection of spirit. And so to help us toward this end, a very significant intercession of the saints occurred in the sacred Himalayan regions of India. In the mid-1800s, the ever-youthful, immortal Mahavatar Babaji revived and reintroduced the sacred science of Kriya Yoga meditation. Up until that time, it was available only to forest ascetics or mountain dwellers in the Himalayas. But through the instrumentality in this age of the SRF YSS lineage of God-realized gurus, this science is being disseminated worldwide for those of us who are ready to remember who we are, to hasten our soul's evolution, and to attain spiritual freedom in God. So what exactly is this path of Kriya Yoga, and how can it help us? I'm going to describe it in the simplest of terms. It is a way of life. It is based on moral and spiritual principles and spiritual practices. So it's not something that we think about every now and then and that we practice occasionally. To wake up one morning and say, I don't think I'm going to meditate today or this weekend. I just don't feel like it. 
to give second place to our soul development and to our relationship with God just isn't an option. Rather, we live this life with a commitment to fulfill our spiritual duty to our soul and to God, and by calm meditation, to gradually unveil that magnificent soul that's within us. So there are three essential practices that are key to achieving this. The first one is a strong desire to meditate, to do the inner work of going within with regularity. Because by regular meditation, we gain direct experience of our soul as a loving, joyous, creative, spiritual being. The second essential practice is a strong mental resolve to do the outer work of refining and redesigning the way we act and interact with others. So this means that we consciously choose to express our soul qualities in everything we think, in everything we do, and everything we say. And the third essential practice will draw God to us like a magnet and will draw us to God like a magnet. And that is to cultivate ever-deepening devotion for the infinite beloved who has created us and who gives us life. And perhaps the greatest expression of devotion would be for us to make a commitment to change, to become a better version of ourselves. You know, a devotional prayer that you can offer in the silence of our souls is to say, let me be like you in all my ways. Let me be like you in all my ways. Let this be your mantra. So why is this threefold approach important? Because sometimes we hear devotees say, you know, I've been meditating for a long time, many years, so when am I going to attain samadhi? Now, samadhi is a blissful state of expansion where we can experience God as light, as love, as joy. And yet, when we ask that question, perhaps we haven't realized that, well, we have a little bit more work to do. Because spiritual unfoldment does not only take place during meditation. And Paramahansaji makes this very clear to us. He said, Yoga is not just a science of meditation. It is a science of self-transformation of transforming the little ego into the pure divine self. An essential part of the yoga path is the conscious effort to improve and spiritualize oneself by exercise of the innate qualities of the soul. Dayamataji said, Gurudev used to tell us that his guru, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, often gave this advice, learn to behave. And when Gurudev first said this to me, I thought, oh, that's simple. All I have to do is be polite and kind every day. There's nothing to it. I had much to learn, Ma said. Learning to behave is everything. Early on, when Guruji was establishing his mission here in the West, those disciples around him were kept quite busy helping him. And one day I asked Madalini Ma if during those early years they were able to fit in periods of meditation. And she looked off into the distance as to reflect on those early years and she said, Oh yes, we all try to include periods of long meditation because that was an essential part of the sadhana that Guruji gave for us to follow. But then she added, however, 
the one thing that attracted Gurudev's attention next to the devotee's love for God was kindness, thoughtfulness, and selfless service to others. If you wanted praise from Guruji, just do some little act of service, not just for him, but for others. That caught his eye like nothing else. Outward show of devotion or long hours of meditation without an accompanying expression of virtue, that never impressed Master. Spiritual behavior a smile for someone in need, giving kindness, love, and support to others while forgetting the little self and its own sorrows, that impressed Master. Because then he saw that you were reaping the benefits of your meditations, overcoming the little self, and striving to behave as Divine Mother's noble children. such words of wisdom. And it was always like that with Merlini Ma. She was like a perpetual fount of insight, understanding, and wisdom. Guruji said, an essential part of the yoga path is a conscious effort to improve and spiritualize oneself. And this is what he said happens when you try to do that. Little by little, a spiritual change will come to the true followers of this path and their influence will spread over the world. And when we reflect on our own lives, many of us have experienced our own inner transformation. And I want to read to you what two devotees wrote about that. One devotee said, The practice of Kriya itself has brought me tranquility, balance, inner peace, and a different attitude toward the world, my relationships, and life in general. My relationship with my husband has changed, too. We have much more affection, tenderness, respect. We are much more connected. He changed. I changed. My children changed, everything changed around us. Another devotee wrote, In the midst of my daily duties, I find that my mind remains anchored in God. I feel a loving, intimate attunement with Him. I'm overwhelmed with gratitude because I feel that I am changing and maturing on the spiritual path. This is so beautiful because when we make the effort, when we change and mature, that, all of that is reflected in our innermost thoughts, in our innermost feelings, in our actions and in our interactions with others, and especially in what we are becoming. And this reminds me of a beautiful story of Bhagavan Sri Krishna that I especially love. It takes place during a great feast that the Lord held for some of his allies. And during the dinner, one of the rulers of another Indian prov- province and an army asked Lord Krishna, he said, Krishna, why is it that your men never lose a battle. They always win. They're always victorious. And Krishna looked at him with that irresistible charm and that beguiling smile, and he said, Because my men are like me. Who of us wouldn't want the Lord to say that about us? My devotees are becoming like me. That's just so beautiful. Now, while his men surely looked upon him as a great warrior, as a military leader, they also loved and revered him as this divine incarnation. And they 
strive to be in tune with him and to become like him in every way. And it was their efforts and his blessing that empowered them with his almighty force so that in battle they were able to prevail over the darkness of evil. And it's the same for each one of us. Whenever we face our own challenges, whether it's an external challenge or an inner battle, let us never be discouraged. But remember that the Lord is with us and that he will bless our efforts and will impart to us his divine strength, his courage, and his power to prevail no matter what happens. There's a saying, where Dharma is, there is Krishna. Where Krishna is, there is victory. So, what are the soul qualities that Krishna's men strive to emulate to become like him? In the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna cites 26 sattvic or elevating soul qualities. And our guru in his commentary on this chapter in his book, God Talks with Arjuna, explains that these 26 qualities are divine attributes that have been bestowed upon us by God and that we should strive to express all of them. Because the more we express these divine virtues, the more we reflect the divine image of God in which we are made. And as Krishna said, they will make us godlike. So now I want to just read a few of these qualities. And as I read them, I'd like you to just close your eyes and reflect that these qualities are inherent within you and that you have the free will to choose to express all of them anytime you choose. Fearlessness, forgiveness, ahimsa or harmlessness, purity of heart, compassion, patience, peacefulness, truthfulness, gentleness, freedom from wrath, self-restraint, humility or lack of conceit, perseverance in acquiring wisdom and in practicing yoga. These are just a few. And Krishna said, O oh Arjuna, these are the qualities and the wealth of a divinely inclined person. Many years ago, when I was a young nun, Mrilini Mata had led an all-day Christmas meditation in honor of Christ. And the next day, I thanked her for her inspiration. And I said to her, the meditation was so deep, and everyone in the chapel was so still that it was difficult to leave the chapel. And then I made a statement that generated a session of spiritual guidance that I've never forgotten because it gave me an entirely new perspective on the spiritual path. I said, and after the meditation, I found that I just was not eager at all to become involved in activity again. And she looked at me with those beautiful eyes of wisdom and she said, I understand your sentiment, dear, but wait a minute. What about... Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And her words took me aback. They made me pause because I was not grasping her point at all. And so she went on and explained. She said, what we experience in meditation, we must express outwardly in activity 
This is our duty. This is how God's kingdom is manifest on earth, how his will is done on earth through us, his children. You know, that made such a deep impression on me. I never looked or thought about it that way. And yes, God has to do his will on the earth. Have you ever thought about how do I know I'm doing God's will? How does God do his will on the earth? He does it through any one of us who consciously chooses to express the supreme goodness of our souls in everything we do, in everything we think, in everything we say. The first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita opens with two opposing armies standing on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. On the one side are the Kauravas and their great warriors, and on the other side are the Pandavas and their vast army with Sri Krishna as their guide. And these two armies are positioned and ready for war over the kingdom of Hastinapur. And while sitting in his great chariot, Arjuna asks Krishna, take me in between these two armies. And he surveys who are those who are now posing as his enemies. And then he realizes that those enemies are his uncles, his cousins, his beloved teachers, his in-laws, his grandfather, and other great warriors and all their sons. And he asks, why are they about to perish? What is the purpose of this? And he becomes utterly despondent and he throws down his bow and he refuses to fight, turning to Krishna for advice. Now, who does Arjuna represent? Guruji says he represents the soul. He represents our soul. He represents all of humanity, <laughs> really. And that battle, that is the battle that we all fight over ordinary human consciousness, between ordinary human consciousness and our soul's pure qualities and goodness. Now listen to the poetic way in which Paramahansaji describes the immortal truth that Krishna conveys to his disciple about fulfilling his dharmic duty. Urging Arjuna to take up unreservedly his divine duty in the supernal cosmic workings, the Universal Lord exhorts him, Arise, awake, my agent thou. Oh, this is how I work my plans, the universe, through instruments diverse. Arise, awake, my agent thou. This is how. I work my plans, the universe, through instruments diverse. Lord Krishna urges Arjuna and all of us to become active participants in the universal plan, instruments of God's divine will. Why? Because Guruji said their influence will spread all over the earth. We have the power in our hands to make a difference and to support the evolutionary shift that is silently underway in the consciousness of the entire human race, even in the midst of this pandemic. Our Guru said, the awakened ones Tune in with divine will, and thus their efforts are all directed toward bringing his will upon the earth. Their dynamic, active prayer is, thy will be done. Let this be 
the dynamic active prayer of each one of us. Every day, we stand on the inner battlefield of our own mind and consciousness. And life presents us with numerous opportunities to win the battle of life by expressing the supreme goodness and virtue of our souls. So now let's explore the application of one of those virtues, the quality of forgiveness. Because I think that each one of us can relate to a time when we had to forgive someone who had done something that was deeply upsetting to us. And when that happens, usually the human reaction is to feel hurt, sad, angry, depressed, discouraged, and so forth. And experiencing these feelings is actually a very valid part of the healing process up to a certain point. Because if we allow those emotions to take us on a roller coaster ride over that hurt, because we haven't been able to let it go, it's going to do us more harm than good. And we will suffer and we will have no peace. So as devotees, it's very important for us to view hurtful situations as golden opportunities to attune ourselves with that forgiveness, with that compassion that's already inherent within us. And let's look at what the Mahabharata says. This is one of India's two major Sanskrit epics. It tells us this about forgiveness. One should forgive under any injury. Forgiveness is holiness. Have you ever thought of it that way? Forgiveness is holiness. Forgiveness is the might of the mighty. Forgiveness is quiet of mind. Forgiveness and gentleness are the qualities of the self-possessed. They represent eternal virtue. So forgiveness is not only a holy virtue, but it's also a very powerful and spiritually intelligent way to handle conflict constructively. So let me share with you my own experiment and experience on wrestling with the mind and the emotions when someone was hurtful to me. Every time I entertained undesirable and even negative thoughts about the other person, I saw how those thoughts overtook my mind and left me feeling demoralized, unable to think clearly, uh, confused. It was very stressful for me. And I realized that I needed to find some creative way to shift the mind away from these thoughts and to hold a positive intention toward that person and towards the situation. So I started to pray for release from all negative thoughts. I prayed for a positive outcome to that situation. I especially prayed for the person and I held them in God's light. And I began to reflect on all the beautiful qualities that they had and I realized they had many. And then I made a deliberate effort to pray for understanding as to why the person behaved the way they did. And after a few days of this, I felt my spirits lift and I was no longer focused on the hurt. Then early one morning, something happened that I can only describe as a response to my prayers. I had an insight that the person was struggling with some personal pain and they hadn't been able to resolve that within themselves. And if they could have behaved better toward me, they would have. But they were stuck with this. They were struggling. They were shackled. And so they weren't able to, to behave in the way they would have wanted to. And then along 
with that came a feeling that I can only describe as a glimpse, just a glimpse of the compassion and the love that God has for us. And that glimpse was so overwhelming, so overpowering, that in that moment I said, oh, it doesn't matter, it's okay, it's okay, nothing matters. And I knew in that moment I had forgiven. When we can truly forgive, and we know it's a process, that act of forgiveness gives us the power to transcend ordinary human behavior and to attune with that forgiveness and compassion that's within us. And there's one more beautiful blessing that comes from forgiveness. The more we can forgive, the less and less offended we become, no matter how others treat us. Because in the act of forgiving, we transcend the ego's sense of self-importance and we gain the ability to overlook any offense. And this is why Sri Krishna said that the active expression of these virtues makes us godlike. So now I would like to talk on another subject, and that is how we receive intuitive guidance and what will help us more than anything. One Sunday afternoon, I was driving back from Encinitas Ashram to Mother Center, and another nun was my companion in the car, and I was driving in the carpool lane when suddenly a motorcyclist just whizzed past me. He was probably going about 100 miles an hour, and it startled me. And before I knew it, these words came tumbling out. I hope he gets a ticket. And because I mumbled it, the, my companion uh, leaned over and said, what did you say? And I said, oh, that's dangerous. He could get hurt. And I didn't want to repeat um, what I had said earlier. And following that, these very strong feelings came over me. And it was painful. And I was ashamed. And then immediately following that, these thoughts came, and they were so clear, it was as if a voice was talking to me that said, this is not in keeping with the person that you are trying to become. Now, from where do these strong and wise inner feelings and thoughts come from? Guruji said, Spirit does not necessarily talk through the lips of a form in a vision or a materialized human body, but may intimate words of wisdom through the medium of the devotee's awakened intuition. He also said, and I'm sure we can all relate to this, you know when you're doing wrong, your whole being tells you. And that feeling is God's voice. Good, you also said, everyone has intuition, even you. Intuition is like a light, a flame of knowledge that comes from the soul. It possesses all-sided power to know all there is to be known. Every man and woman inherently possesses some of this power, but in most people, it is undeveloped. Now, we may have strong inner feelings about a decision that we have to make, or maybe we see someone and we get a sense, something about them, and we all can relate to this. This is our soul intuition at work. Every day, in many ways, our soul is busy, wisely prompting us toward right action or reminding us when we've made a misstep and the need to correct our course. And I want to go back to those powerful feelings and that voice that I thought I heard. We could say, well, 
that's my conscience talking to me. And actually, that's absolutely right. But Paramahansaji takes it a step further. He says, the voice of conscience is the voice of God. The voice of conscience is the voice of God. Everyone has it, but not everyone listens to it. God is the whisper in the temple of your conscience, and He is the light of intuition. An intuitive experience is this inner knowingness that bathes your entire being in this powerful perception of truth. It becomes like an unshakable conviction you just know. You don't know how you know, but it's right. And after a while, when you can recognize your intuition is working, there's no more second guessing. You just automatically act on it. And when we meditate and we calm that whirlpool of thoughts, Guruji says that these all-knowing intuitional powers emerge from the superconscious mind to give us spiritual guidance. And the more deeply we meditate, the more active our intuition becomes. And this, this is the point. This is where Master is trying to get us to, to listen to that divine inner prompting. And here's why the why of it all. God sits in the temple of your conscience and whispers words of wisdom to you, indicating what path you should follow. Which of us wouldn't want that? God sits in the temple of your conscience and whispers words of wisdom to you, indicating what path you should follow. Now, we are all trying, and yet there are times when no matter how hard we try, somehow we stumble. What is the obstacle that gets in the way? It's that little ego-driven personality that has been in control for so long. It doesn't want to give up control. It doesn't want to listen to the soul. It's very threatened by the soul, and so it rebels. And it's out there in the forefront in full force. And so the soul is pushed into the background and it's not given any space to express itself. And this is the struggle. This is the battle for the kingdom of Satchitananda, the battle of Kurukshetra, whatever battle you want to call it. This is what happens. One moment we are expressing the supreme goodness of our souls, we're expressing virtue, and the next moment we retreat back to that state of I, me, and mine. And this is why Guruji said, when this I shall die, then will I know who am I. And this is why meditation is key, because without meditation we lose out, but with meditation we transcend that strong identification with that little I. And we realize we are the immortal soul. Guruji tells us that our ego's mental habits and memory grooves are lodged in the conscious, subconscious, and superconscious patterns in the brain. The divine science of Kriya Yoga helps us deal with those ego habits because this is what happens every time we go within. Now listen carefully to Guruji's words because here is the science of it. In meditation, the mind becomes interiorized and withdraws the external activating life force from the muscles and the nerves and concentrates it in the brain cells where the evil tendencies are recorded. This concentrated life energy in meditation burns out the grooves or patterns of mental habits that are lodged in the brain. 
Then he tells us what the divine intelligence of the superconscious mind does with that concentrated energy in the brain. In deep meditation, the superconscious mind uses that relaxed energy in the brain to penetrate into the brain grooves where habits are secreted and it consciously seeks out and cauterizes those evil proclivities. These are the beneficial changes that occur when we practice the techniques, especially Kriya Yoga. And many of you have testified that the more you meditate, the less you are bothered by reactive behaviors and emotions because you are raising the threshold from ordinary human reactions to being centered in mental calmness. So it takes more and more to disturb you. So this is what happens when we make the effort. Now listen to how God blesses that effort. Every time you meditate deeply on God, beneficial changes take place in the patterns of your brain. When you practice the self-realization techniques of meditation, especially Kriya Yoga, you will actually see the light of God baptizing you. If you can see God as light, immediately that light changes your brain cells. Now I want to encourage you that even if you do not see the light, it is still there and those beneficial changes are still taking place if you're sincerely and attentively practicing. And I want to share with you a testimony of a 14-year-old girl who had learned the Hong Sao technique and began to practice it. And in her letter, she describes the transformation that she experienced for, from her own efforts and the soul qualities that began to emerge from within her, blessed by the light of God. First of all, she wrote, the Hong Sao technique is the best thing that I have ever learned because it affects and changes my whole life. After I practice the technique, then mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, I feel peaceful. It is not a normal human describable calm. It is the ultimate peaceful calm. No words can describe it. She goes on, emotionally, I have much more inner happiness and I am much more tolerant. I am much kinder, much more giving. And listen to what she says next. It is as if my soul speaks after I practice this technique. And when I close my eyes and lift my gaze to the third eye, God's big, bright, white light is gazing back at me. Over all, I feel a great peace, which in no other way can be expressed except in itself. Thank you for allowing me to receive this beautiful technique. I would say she was making the most of what she received. So now we may ask, how am I going to do all of this? Start right where you are. Do it in the little things of everyday life. Pray and meditate every day. Start out with 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening if you can, and then extend that time gradually to cultivate that intimate relationship with God, to merge your consciousness with God, meditation is necessary. Pray to God and ask Him, let me be like you in all my ways.
Then throughout the day, be aware of the many opportunities that arise where you can practice, where you can apply these teachings, when you can manifest your soul qualities, when you're interacting with your husband or your wife or your children or your siblings or your boss or your neighbor or that motorcyclist who whizzes past you on the freeway. And then at least once per week, it should be done every day, but at least once per week, set aside time when you can reflect, when you can take the pulse of your life. Where, what is the direction my life is taking? And ask yourself, what am I becoming? and make it a spiritual practice, especially at the end of your meditations, to listen to that inner prompting. This is how our spiritual life translates into action, because we are living it. And we are making a conscious effort to transform ourselves into an awakened soul, one with God. That, that self-transformation, that is the spiritual experience we are all seeking. Not visions, not phenomena. A group of us once asked beloved Mrinalini Ma, what is the best way to help others understand Master's teachings and how can we spread his teachings more effectively? And this was her answer. The real work of every monk and nun in his ashrams and of every householder disciple in the world is to live his ideals. That is our real work. That is the best way to spread his message. Expounding his teachings from the pulpit, giving classes or holding functions at our temples or centers, working on special projects and so forth, these are surely important and they help very much. But what will strengthen and spread our Guru's message more than anything else can is if each one of us lives his noble ideals so that they manifest in everything we think and everything we feel and everything we say and do. And if ever we hesitate or feel unsure that we can do this, let us remember the words of Bhagavan Krishna. Arise, awake my agent thou.